Fantastic. And we are. Hello, Lorraine Boyce. You are a pelvic floor physiotherapist all the way from where you're in Ireland, yeah? I am, yes. I'm in Ireland, yeah. Lovely. Sure. Very nice. Well, I'm up in the there. north of Donegal. Yeah, gorgeous. It's actually been quite nice. I think we're getting the best of it, yeah. Yeah, excellent. That is good. Now, we're discussing tonight a thing that a lot of people don't really like to talk about, despite the fact that it's extremely common with 50% of women over the age of 50 experiencing prolapses, but it's yeah. not something that we talk about an awful lot. So will we start by discussing, first of all, what they are and the different types? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great starting point. Um, so for anyone who has heard of prolapse but doesn't know much about it, this is a very good brief overview. A prolapse is essentially where the pelvic organs have descended a little bit lower into the pelvic, from the pelvic cavity. So our bladder, womb and bowel are meant to be up inside. And due to a number of factors, which we can go over um, in a moment, something happens that the connective tissue and ligaments that hold these organs up inside become either stretched or segments detach. And that means that instead of the suspensory ligaments and connective tissues holding these organs nicely up inside, they're allowed to move that little bit lower. And what you'll feel then is you'll feel a bulging heavy sensation as the organ moves down and presses into the vaginal canal. You may feel a little bit of back ache or a low abdominal ache from where the ligaments are attached on the inside. It's putting, they're, they're on stretch. And it puts a little bit of strain onto their attachment points. So it could be the low back that's achy, it could be the low abdomen that's achy. Um, or you might find that there feels like there's a bit of a blockage in the vag vaginal canal. So it might be that if you're used to using tampons, they don't seem to fit inside as well. Either inserting them is more troublesome or when they're in there, they keep moving off to the side or they keep pressing down and out. Or maybe it feels like that with sex, that there's just something in the way at the start of sex as well. So there could be a number of signs and symptoms, but I think the most common one would be that, that you feel that fullness, that heaviness, a bit of a dragging sensation in the vaginal canal. So that's really what the what a prolapse is. And then there are a few different types. Um, so we can have a prolapse of the bladder, moving down from the front we could have a prolapse of the bowel wall moving down from the front or a prolapse of the womb coming down from the top and you can have a combined pattern as well you can have a combined bladder and bowel prolapse um, more unusually then we can have a rectal prolapse most of these prolapses press down and into the vaginal canal but we can have a prolapse where the um, it protrudes out of the back passage itself. It's, it's less common. But I do know, and this is why it's so good to have this conversation, so many clients come into me saying that they have been for their smear test or they've been to the doctor or they've been you know, to a consultant who's told them that they have a prolapse, but they have, haven't been told what type of prolapse. And they presume it's actually the womb that's coming down and they are thinking in their mind they need to have a hysterectomy and actually when I do an internal exam and then it turns out well actually it's a mild bladder prolapse you know it completely changes how they think about it so I think it's really good to know that there are different types so if anyone is having um, prolapse symptoms they can ask more questions and they know what questions to ask as well. Absolutely now you mentioned they're a mild one so they grade them don't they how do they grade them? Yeah. So the great prolapses in terms of severity of presentation, it can be mild, moderate and severe. We grade them in terms of a, a stage one, stage 2A, 2B, stage three and stage four. So stage one is the mildest presentation. Stage four is the most kind of advanced presentation that we would see. Stage one might be that there is a degree of prolapse there. There's a little bit of laxity or give in the connective tissues. The organ is moving down a little bit, but it's not presenting to the outside. So if you were to check yourself or I were to check an, an internal exam, we wouldn't see a bulge protruding through the vaginal passageway. So we wouldn't see, for example, any bulge coming to or through the opening. Whereas with a stage four prolapse, stage three and four, certainly there's more of a 
extrusion. It, you know, it, it looks and feels like people would come in and say, and I feel like I have a bit of a ball or a bulge or something protruding out to the outside. So that would be kind of the, the grading system we use. So at least again, you, I think it's good to know um, the stage of it because the stage of prolapse you have can change with the right management. If you get the right pelvic floor exercises and support from there, you might do a little bit of management of what you're doing daily that causes pressure to bear down on your prolapse. Your grading of prolapse could change from a 2B to a 2A or a 2A to a 1. And that changes how it feels and how it looks on presentation. It dramatically changes it. So I think it's, it's and I love having, I love giving people the stage of their prolapse on the first appointment when they come into me for assessment so that then I can recheck that at their follow-up appointments and they can see their progression. You know, it's quite reassuring, motivating for clients working on their pelvic floor health if they started with a stage to the prolapse. Then it presents after two follow-ups to a stage 2A, and then maybe it's presenting as a stage one, you know, and it, you can see that nice progression in the in the symptoms and in their management of it as well, which is great. All right. So in terms of getting to progression, basically we get, um, you know, everybody's, you know, sort of, are you doing your Kegels? Have you done yeah. your Kegels? Um, are Kegels the be-all and end-all of pelvic floor health? And how do we, how do we know how to do them properly and who are they appropriate for? Yeah, so there is, um, you know, I think there is a big focus on Kegels. And when you think of pelvic floor physio, you think of Kegels and you're going to be taught how to do Kegels. And it, they are important, but they're certainly not the, the only thing in terms of, especially with the prolapse, they're certainly not the only thing. Um, so in terms of how important they are, I certainly would advise most of my clients with prolapse in pelvic floor exercises and I teach them how to do it right and I can talk through that in a moment but I also you know I could have somebody doing the exact right technique for their pelvic floor exercises at the right volume and they're doing it consistently but if they're doing something every day that's causing intra-abdominal pressure to bear down repetitively it's going to offset the benefit that they're getting from their pelvic floor exercises. They certainly will still be that prolapse symptomatic. For example, I had a lady in recently who had a mildish prolapse and she had started to lift her toddler out of a new um, cot, which had a high side and she was bending over it and then lifting her toddler who was getting quite heavy. And she said that, you know, she was feeling the prolapse more symptomatic. So when we changed what she was doing, we got her to get a little footstep. I instructed her, her instructed her how to breathe and how to dissipate the pressure um, as she was lifting. And that seemed to resolve a lot of the issue brought up back to baseline. So managing intra-abdominal pressure as well as Kegels. And from the point of view of Kegels, I think everyone who comes into me expects to be doing these squeeze and tighten and hold. And, and that's part of it. But for, for people coming into me for pelvic floor assessment, as many people come into me with a tight, overactive, shortened up pelvic floor, as I would see as many clients who have weak, lax, soft, stretched pelvic floor muscles who do need maybe those strengthening exercises to tone them up and create a bit more support and, and shorten up the muscle length. Whereas there are people who have tight, overactive pelvic floors, they're gripping in the background, maybe they have pelvic pain, and they actually need to be taught to relax the muscles and they'll function so much better when they relax. So as many people need what I would kind of simplify as reverse Kegels, where you actually learn to relax them and lengthen them as people need uh, strengthening and toning. So yeah, it's really important to get maybe an assessment to figure that out if you're not sure yourself. And that's where, as you were asking there, you know, you can go to a pelvic floor physiotherapist like myself, and there are many out there. And I can do, uh, and I can talk you through it. If somebody's not happy to have an internal assessment for whatever reason, I can do a really thorough one-to-one, -one, you know, a description and instruction of pelvic exercises. But generally, if somebody's happy for me to do it, I'll do a little internal uh, checkup and I can then advise them on their technique. So I can advise them on, you know, how to breathe correctly through it. How strongly should you be contracting and holding? Um, and all of those fine points, because if you're going to put time and effort into doing these pelvic floor exercises every day, you want to know that that time is at least being put to good use and you're going to get the max value from the time and effort you're putting in. 
And I always see two common things. One is that people are over squeezing. They expect to feel more than they, you know, than they do. So it's much more subtle than people think. And also people tend to hold their breath. They tend to max squeeze and then hold, 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 instead of breathing through it and maybe engaging with a breath out. So all of that can be trained. And once we know it, you know it indefinitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned there interuterine, um, interuterine, inter interabdominal abdominal pressure. I can't even talk today. Um, which, given that we're at the moment, we're being told that we need to do an awful lot more weight lifting and things like that to keep our yeah. muscles in good strength. Um, if people are going to the gym and they're about to start or they have been doing uh, weight programs and they find that it, you know, that it is increasing their their risk of a prolapse or they're feeling like they need to pee, um, how do how do we sort of manage that? Yeah, so I think that's something quite common I would see in the clinic, people who are really keen to do some weight training, some exercise, and yet then it's how do I introduce it? What's safe? What? How do I keep myself symptom-free as I'm doing it? And there are some very good um, things we can do. I would advise uh, if somebody has a very symptomatic prolapse, maybe starting with pelvic floor instruction and some even anti-gravity, you know, strength training, like, you know, bridge exercises where you're lifting your pelvis up, it's anti-gravity. Um, you know, there's a lot of nice mini band resistance exercises for the glutes. There's some nice low intensity core exercises to build a base of strength. But then it's almost like climbing a set of stairs. You know, you're thinking the first step back to doing full weight training at your the intensity and the frequency that you want to do. Step one, get pelvic floor, you know, get technique to learn what you're meant to do. Make that a habit, you know, and learn to engage your core with low intensity, get the glutes fired up. Maybe then it might be working on some low impact or no impact, maybe some type of cardio work. Um, maybe then doing some of the controlled weights you know and that's where i would instruct clients in when to breathe the right time and how many reps you know would be appropriate i think that the trick with um you know lifting weights for prolapse would be to begin over a series of weeks or months start training at a weight level where you can breathe easy through if somebody goes to do a deadlift and they have their the shape of the bar in hand and they're having to breathe out the top and they because the weight is so heavy that they're struggling to do that without literally breathing in and holding the breath through the entire movement and then just letting a little exhale to top that's creating a lot of intra-abdominal pressure as opposed to having a weight that you can start with that's manageable where you can start you've got bar in hand you're thinking and then breathe out the effort that, that breath out can dissipate a lot of the intra-abdominal pressure. And so I would encourage people to start at a weight that's quite manageable, build a base. When the big outer muscles in your body get conditioned, they'll be able to tolerate lifting more without it being transferred onto the pelvic floor. Instead of the pelvic floor taking a hit, the big outer muscles have already been working and training over the weeks and months. They've built up their base and they're well ready then for you to start increasing your weight. And so keeping the, the reps high and the weight low so reps and sets high so you might think of doing eight sets at 10 reps at 25 kg for deadlifts instead of starting off with a trainer maybe instructing you to do you know 50 kg for three sets of two reps so thinking of your reps <laughs> you're talking about the very strong women here <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is it. And, and so it's looking at, you know, reps and sets, looking at weights, um, looking at your breathing technique during it. I think the big thing is to, to encourage women to think positively about a prolapse and not be thinking that I have so many clients who come into me saying, oh, my consultant told me never to squat again, never to lift beyond 5 kg. But when we even think about our day. We're squatting all the time and out of chairs up and down to the, the washing machine and we're in and out of cars. We're squatting all the time and we are lifting maybe more than five kg with a washing basket and groceries. And so day to day we have to do this. We should actually focus on training our body in a nice controlled way to manage those uncontrolled circumstances we meet during the day. And it's one of those things that prolapse does not mean that you can't exercise Prolapse is we just have to work around it a little bit, whether it's compression wear, outer compression wear that gives a bit of outside lift and support to the perineum, whether it's with pelvic floor exercises, whether it's with pessaries, whatever we need to do, we can do 
And then that allows you to return into your training, may need to be guided by a trainer, by a pelvic floor physio, but there's no reason we can't get people back exercising and training really functionally. Absolutely. We will get to pessaries, but I have a question yes. here, um, which is from Pauline, who is asking, what are the realistic chances of a vaginal vault prolapse improving? I had a hysterectomy five months ago and have a vaginal vault prolapse. It's really impacting on me physically and mentally, poor thing. Can you well, welcome people? Yeah, so I mean, a vaginal vault prolapse, for anyone who actually who's listening who doesn't know what vaginal vault prolapse is, um, I think you said that she had a hysterectomy five months ago, so they've removed the womb, they have, you know, the cervix may still be there, there's maybe where the cervix, if the cervix was removed, there's still um, the top of the vaginal canal is there, they've sutured that up, but maybe again due to, you know, um, lack of pelvic floor support or intra-abdominal pressure changes, that vault where the top of the vagina has now started to descend down the canal again a vaginal vault prolapse may be a little bit more manageable to work with than when she had potentially maybe if it was if the reason for her hysterectomy was maybe a uterine prolapse vaginal vault prolapse may be a little bit easier to work with because the womb is a heavy organ and when it starts to move down it's harder to get it to lift back up but a soft material pessary may be tolerated quite well for her to give a little bit of lift to the vaginal vault it may be used all the time indefinitely. It may be used just at her peak times of pressure. So if she is going for a walk or she's going to be on her feet doing a lot of housework and shopping, if she's going to be going to the gym to do a class, she may put in the pessary and learn to take that in and out herself. Um, so maybe using a pessary would give her good symptomatic relief while then she gets some instruction in pelvic floor exercises, how to manage constipation, how to, you know, breathe to manage your intra-abdominal pressure in the day. Because it is something I've seen a lot over the years, you know, maybe women going in for hysterectomy or uh, repair, you know, a bladder bowel organ repair, um, prolapse repair, they get the surgery done. And from the hospital's point of view, they're they're discharged. They're said, listen, do some pelvic floor exercise. And that is it. There's no intensive follow-up or rehab or, you know, plan in place to prevent it happening again. And it can recur. And mm. I, I see clients coming in at the point where maybe it was five months ago, maybe it was five or 15 years ago. And they're saying, I had a repair, I had a hysterectomy and now I'm getting symptomatic again. And I think if there was that little bit more maybe post-operative um, rehab and post-operative advice and management to get the body back fully um, rehabbed and to know what to look out for, to keep the bowel moving, you know, all those things can make a difference. Um, so for anyone who is in the, in the position at the moment listening, who is potentially going in for surgery or who, you know, might be considering that in the future, it's great to know that getting surgery will lift up the, the tissues again but then that's part one part two is then how is it functioning so the, the circumstances that caused it in the first place don't cause it again um, and for that lady who has the vaginal vault um, symptoms again it depends on how much that vault is coming down if it's a stage one two a two b where it's internal or just just to the opening where you can just feel it coming through the opening then that likely can improve with some really good advice and intervention. If it's a stage three or four where it's down quite a, a little bit more and it's, it's there all the time, then again, that probably sounds like it might need some kind of pessary or intervention like that. May manage without a pessary and just some really good pelvic floor training, glutes and core training, some advice and management if it's a stage one, stage two, A, two, B. So I think the first protocol for that lady would be to get a pelvic health physio in her, in her area to do a good assessment and then give her a really tailored plan. Yeah, yeah. she says she started seeing one, which is a good thing. Um, the, you mentioned pessaries there. So tell yes. us a little bit about pessaries, what they do, how they work, and, um, and yeah, basically that's it really. What, what are they? What yeah. do they do? How do they work? So pessaries um, are little kind of silicone um, inserts that are inserted into the vaginal space to hold the organs up. I like to think of them as kind of scaffolding, just kind of holding the organ up into place. And they come in different styles and different sizes. So generally, the most basic type is a ring type shape like this. And when I, when I show these to clients, I mean, they can be quite large. I mean, compared to the size of my palm, that is quite large. Um, when clients see these for the first time, they kind of, their eyes open wide and they kind of pull back in their seats and they're thinking, that's going to save me. I don't think so. How? <laughs> yeah, it's just like, um, what are you talking about here? So 
Um, but the, 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 I want to explain to them then how they work. These fold to go over. So this is the size of it, but it folds in half to go over. So it really narrows how wide it is. The narrowest part of the vaginal area is the opening itself. Then inside, there's a lot more space that we need to fill and these need to fill the space there to provide the support back up of the organs. So these fold in two to go in through the opening and then when they're in there, they'll expand and then that's when they're going to do their job of supporting the organs back up. And rather than sitting, you know, like this, where I think people imagine them sitting, you know, horizontal, they actually sit more at a vertical oblique angle. And, and when these are in place, if you have the right size and the right fit and the right option for you, you shouldn't be aware of it. You should forget it's there. You shouldn't be aware of any discomfort. It should be doing its job. It should be staying in place. Sometimes these are fitted and I have clients coming in saying, well, I had maybe a, a GP or a consultant fit a pessary and it didn't stay in place. And it may be that neither maybe wasn't the right style of pessary or it wasn't the right fit or else a pessary like this is just not going to stay in place. There are pessaries that work with a little bit of suction effect, so they don't require closure of the vaginal opening to keep them in place. If the opening is a little bit, has a little bit more laxity where it potentially could come out every time you bear down to pass a bowel movement, there are pessaries that work by suction, little tube pessaries and other types. And we have pessaries that are plain rings. We have pessaries with a little extra bladder supports. We have more closed type pessaries, which are better for the womb to sit on to. Um, so there's lots of different styles, lots of different shapes. You know, they can be as small as this. They can, and this is not even the largest size. So there's lots of variation and they can be either kept in place for long periods of time, like three to six months, and then just get a check with your whoever fitted it. Or you can learn how to, put it in and take it out yourself. So you have more freedom of control over it. Some people need to wear them all day, every day for support. And some people can get away with only needing them at their points of max impact or intensity, like an exercise class. All right. Good question that comes out of that is then you met or two questions. Um, and I have a very good question for you here from Max Mumford, which I will ask in a second is, okay. You mentioned that they can stay in place for a period of time. Can you have sex with them? Um, and if the, if you're needing to take them in and out, if they're ones that you know that you, you do want to have sex, or they can't stay in place all the time, um, is it easy to do it yourself? Or do you have well, to? Um, yeah, so you can. Um, it depends on the size of the, the pessary, whether you can have sex, and the style of pessary. With the open type pessaries, with the larger pessaries, it is possible to have sex with them in because essentially your partner would be coming in through the center or, you you know, there's there's a low scope for that for penetration. Um, and I had one lady who I fitted a pessary for and I asked her, I said, well, listen, if you go home and try it, try this to see and then we can work around showing you how to take it out if you can't have sex with it. And, and she came back into me saying, well, I went home and I tried to have sex and I didn't tell my husband it was there. I wanted to see if he would notice any difference. So that was one way to try it out. Um, but there was no problems. It didn't interfere with the sensation for either of them. It gave support. So that was perfect. Smaller sizes, you know, and again, smaller than this potentially, might not allow you to have penetration up through the center because it's going to be too narrow. And closed pessary types like this, Again, you can't, that this was filling the space inside. It's not going to allow you penetration through it. So it depends on the type and the size. If it's too small a size, if it's a small size, um, or it's a closed type pessary where there's no open part in the middle, they would need to be removed for sex. And they, they are easy enough to remove with a little bit of practice and with the right instruction. Like I know I like to say to my clients, it's like, when I was younger and I was learning how to put in and out contact lenses, the first time I did that, it took me about half an hour to get it positioned right on my finger and then figure out what hand it was using for what and to get ready to touch my eyeball. <laughs> and then to take it out was again another day's work. After a few times of doing that, I was picking up the lens, popping it in, job done. And it's the same with these. You know, the first time you do it, it's like learning how to put in and out tampons. It might be a little bit awkward. You might try it and think, oh, that doesn't feel right or that took me quite a while. But 
after a few times and with the right guidance from your physiotherapist, you could be able to put them in and out yourself. And as a general rule, you should, you know, if somebody has mobility issues in their back or shoulder and they can't reach down that far, if it's causing pain, again, I wouldn't maybe suggest looking to take them in and out. But um, and for the most part, these rings are quite easy to take in and out. Sometimes these type of pessaries, again, the style of pessary might make it a little bit more difficult. But for the most part, the rings that are plain rings, you know, you can reach in, you can hook your finger over the edge and then you can pull it down. So, yeah. yeah. Which leads me then very nicely into the question uh, from Max here. And she was saying that a gynecologist mentioned to her, her pessary as an option, but because she has vaginal atrophy, it wasn't the best idea. Can they work if you have a severely atrophied um, internal vaginal cavity? Because I mean, yeah, I, so I do, and I have the E string, and I, you know, it did worry me when I was taking it out a couple of times, especially with a fingernail. Um, you know, yeah. am I going to, you know, scratch that and and, and cause myself serious, um, cause myself discomfort and un unhappiness? <laughs> <laughs> can can they be used? And if are there, you know, would it, would it be sort of like you know, with, you know preparing for a, sm a smear if you have trouble with the smear? You know, perhaps using topical estrogen for a few months before you have it inserted or something. Are there practical tips that could help? Yeah, so I mean, it's certainly something I would screen for in my clients as well. I'm looking out for anyone who has any symptoms of vaginal atrophy or if they have, you know, symptoms of low estrogen, like itchiness, recurrent UTIs, you know, dryness of the tissues. That can mean that the pessary is a little bit more difficult to insert and remove in that. As this goes in, now the soft pessaries fold really nicely. You can see how easily that folds. You know, I can nearly, you know, molded really easily there are some pessaries that are a lot firmer and they if there's someone has quite a vaginal atrophy presentation and the tissues are quite thin and dry and they don't tolerate stretch well and as a firmer bulkier pessary has to go inside it may create a little bit too much stretch at the opening so it may create a little bit of a stretch and create a little hack of a cut here Hmm. And that's where I would always be saying, and then as you said yourself, you know, inside, when it is inside, is it going to friction against the sides of the walls? Is it here and rubbing um, really, you know, is it friction and rubbing the inside of the walls as you move? And is that going to create a graze or friction or rotation? So I think if somebody is at risk of that, if I would either suggest a course of vaginal estrogen in whatever form it might be, pessary, cream, e-string, whatever it might be, a course of vaginal estrogen first for anything from three months, six months, even nine months. And I have recommended the clients do that first and come back to me then for the pessary fit. That can improve the, the tissue health immensely, but then pessaries are tolerated so much better. And also if somebody had a lot of vaginal atrophy, I certainly would be staying away from the firmer material pessaries. And I'd be looking at the more soft flexi options that fold easier to go in and also fold easier to come back out because the softer the material even as you're taking it out it will actually fold a little bit as it comes out whereas the firmer material yeah, they really cool. don't and then there's a lot more stretch on the tissues so i think we're trying to reduce stretch we're trying to improve the health of the tissue Issue. and also monitoring you know if I do fit a pessary for somebody and they have um, you know a bit of vaginal atrophy I'm much more careful to really review them at intervals when their pessary has been introduced you know within 24 48 hours within you know 10 days to two weeks then maybe at you know uh, six weeks after that and rather than jumping from fitting it and then saying okay we'll see you in three to six months I'll be much more careful to monitor it as as it goes along to make sure there's no discomfort to check the tissue health and Again, there are so many really soft flexi pessaries out there now that are great for vaginal atrophy, but vaginal estrogen is the big one. Yeah. Actually, interestingly, um, somebody sent me this the other day. Actually, I met he didn't send me. I met with the man who's producing this, and not as a um, but it's it's a disposable um set. So basically you sort of put it in yeah. yourself sort of pull it out on a on a sort of daily thing. This is more for bladder um support. Yes, yeah. But um, but interesting. It's interesting yeah, that so there is coming up you yeah know. there's a lot of different um you know options for pessaries especially for bladder uh prolapse with a womb prolapse um we generally need something quite supportive like the closed pessary options for bladder prolapse especially if it's just the bladder neck if if this is the if my hand is the bladder and this is the urethra there's meant to be an angle you know, at the bladder neck that can help us to keep it dry. If that yep. starts to, um, you know, 
kind of straighten out a little bit, it means then that we can result in leakage. And that's where those little light disposable pessaries are great for inserting and to give the bladder neck that little bit of support. So it just means that it's just kind of creating that kink in the, the neck between the urethra and bladder, and that can support the bladder. And there's lots of different types, shapes, styles. Now, the downside of some of the disposable ones is obviously they're maybe single use. So you have, there's an ongoing cost involved with them. Um, some options you can use for three, four months, and then they kind of start to degrade and break down and again, need to be replaced. Some of these kind of silicone pastries will last for years. You can you know thoroughly clean them, reinsert them, and they last. So I think if cost was a factor for some people, that would be something to keep in mind. But otherwise, if somebody, especially for someone just to trial out if a pest rate is going to work for them, you know, or they're happy that they only need it maybe two or three times a week. If somebody has a bladder prolapse, that only gives them bother when they go for a run two or three times a week. And other than that, they don't leak, they've no heaviness. Something like the contrail there where they can put that in two or three times a week and then the rest of the week they don't need to worry about it. So there's lots of pros and cons and there's so many types and absolutely worth having a good talk with a physiotherapist to discuss the different types and all the factors, you know, convenience of insertion, because those will be a lot easier to insert themselves than maybe some of these. Um, so that's ease of, you know, ease of insertion, ease of use. Uh, cost, you know, convenience, what, how often do you need it? Do you need max support? Do you need light support? So all of that would be factors in what type yeah. of style. It's a very complicated area. Now, you mentioned lifestyle yes. things there that um, contribute to these. Um, if people do have a, if they, a, if they want to avoid one or B, if they have one, what sort of lifestyle factors impact on them and how can we improve those? Yes, yeah, so there's a few. Um, one of the, the, the big things um, that I look for, well, two of the big things that I look for when I'm doing an assessment for somebody's pelvic health is, do they have any chronic constipation or straining to passive bowel movement? And is there any respiratory, chronic respiratory issues? And actually, the third one would be, are they doing much lifting and carrying in their day? Um, you know, I've seen a lady come into me recently who developed a prolapse, maybe six to nine months after she had become a carer for her husband, where she was doing a lot of manually lifting and helping him out of the chair and then out of the shower and out of the car. And she was doing a lot of where she was kind of holding her breath and then heaving the, the, the body weight up. And so then she started to develop perhaps the repetitive load of that started to have an impact on her pelvic floor. We were able to, again, resolve that, bring it back, which was brilliant. Um, but it was just a very good example of that, you know, that, daily lifting exertion, you know, lifting children, lifting grandchildren, lifting heavy items at your work. If you're working in a shop where you're having to lift heavy items, you know, that would something would be something to look at. Um, the respiratory issues, if you're chronically coughing um, or anything like that, if you're prone to chest infections, if you have asthma, if there's any reason why you're coughing a lot, every time we cough, it pushes up pressure downward inside. And that can it's almost like it, all the little repetitive loads eventually add up and it can tip things over that it becomes a prolapse. It could be building for years. You may have been coughing for years before you start feeling any symptoms. And all of a sudden, someday you cough and you think, oh, what, what's happening there? What am I feeling? And it could be that it was just waiting to happen. It was in the buildup from repetitive loading. And the third one there would be constipation. So if you're straining to pass your bowel movement and you know, somebody, I think constipation is an interesting one. People would say and consider themselves not to be constipated if they're going every day. We think of constipation as if you're going every four or five days a week, you know, that's constipated. But actually, you could be going every day. But if it's a hard to pass bowel movement, if the stool is hard and you've to spend five, ten minutes straining and pushing and holding your breath and pushing down, then that is constipation. You know, it should be regular it should be easy to pass. It shouldn't take much effort and strain. I had a lady in who had uh, quite a severe uterine prolapse who hadn't had any children, which is normally the trigger we, we associate with prolapse. She hadn't had a family. She had chronic constipation over the years and she was doing some manual lifting and carrying and it, over the time had developed a, a quite a significant prolapse and so that really showed the effect of things like constipation on her pelvic floor as well so managing all those getting the advice and information about those it makes such a difference so in terms of managing chronic constipation if you have that what sort of changes can you make in your lifestyle to to get rid of that constipation 
Well, some of it, what I would tend to look at is, is it a stool consistency issue? And like, is it a diet fiber issue where the stool is really hard? It's slowly going down through your digestive system. It's in there for a few days. It's getting hard and dehydrated. Do we need to work with it from that point of view? Or is there some reason why your emptying technique, how you push it out is ineffective? Are you actually tightening up when you're meant to be opening and relaxing the back passage? Are you really forcibly straining when you hold your breath and bear down? Or could we do a little bit to manage both? Can we add more fiber? And there's lots of ways to do that. Can we make sure there's plenty of hydration um, for the stool? So can we soften the stool consistency and that will make it move through the digestive system that bit quicker and more regularly. But then can we also look at your emptying strategy? So can we get maybe a little footstool under your feet to open up the bowel passageway? Can we get you to breathe out as you're bearing down? So if I was bearing down, I would be thinking, so breathe out to bear down. Can we add a little bit of support? So at the area in front of the back passage, between the vagina and the back passage, even reaching down and just using the pads of your fingers for a little bit of counter pressure. So as you're bearing down, you're applying a little bit of upward support here and it can give the perineum a little bit of support as well. So um, and there's a little device called a FEMIS, which is great. Um, I'll put that in my stories for in the next few 24 hours if anyone's interested in finding out more about it because I don't have it to hand right now. But there are lots of ways to support the bowel moving and even that makes a difference in A, preventing a prolapse happening and B, if you have a prolapse, improving the stage of it, improving how symptomatic it feels. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any other important things we should think about before? Um, have, have we covered it? I think we've covered most of it there. One little thing as well, and I have a recent reel. If anyone goes into my page on Instagram or Facebook and looks back a few reels ago, I did a little reel on a, on a garment called a V2 supporter, but there's also compression wear, boxer briefs and, and the items like that. So if somebody for some reason cannot tolerate pessaries, they don't stay in place, they maybe have vaginal atrophy and they can't tolerate them or whatever. Some people just say, listen, I'm just, I don't like the idea of using them. Something like a V2 supporter is an outer compression wear. It provides a little bit of closure at the perineum, so it supports upward, keeps the vaginal area a little bit more closed. Keeps, if you have a prolapse that is coming down and pressing out of the vaginal passageway, having the V2 supporter keeps a little bit of support there that it doesn't allow it to come out or as much. And I've had a few clients recently who've gone for that option, first of all, along with pelvic floor exercises, and they've had really good relief. And so something like a V2 supporter could be good to keep in your mind as well, because I know we talked about pestries, but then they're maybe not for everyone or they don't work for everyone. So there are other options as well. Yeah, brilliant. That is good to know. I'm assuming that they're probably not the most attractive form of underwear. They're, yeah, they don't look great, but I must say the V2 supporter, at least it is quite subtle that when you have it on, it goes on over your underwear, you pull on your clothes over it, unless you were wearing maybe a very silky satiny dress or very light colour like that. It, the straps of it wouldn't really show through. Um, it is quite flexible. You can bend and move and, and it doesn't feel uncomfortable that way. Um, and for the most part, for most people's like work uniform or exercise uniform, you know, or what you would wear to exercise, you wouldn't notice it. But certainly if you're going to maybe like a wedding, you're wearing a very tight fitted dress, straps might show through. But for the most part, it's quite, um, it's, it's quite subtle. Um, it's, yeah, that's quite a good option to look at. And there's boxer brief um, shorts and things as well and lots of garments. But they're not the most attractive, but they do do the job at the same time. So, And if it means that you can actually get out and do stuff and feel comfortable, then um, then that's got to be a win-win, really. That's it. You know, if you going back to the exercise, if you had maybe a pessary insert and outer compression wear and you're working on all the right things with pelvic floor, that could mean the difference of you getting back to doing the class you want to do weightlifting, getting back running, and then that has knock-on benefits to your muscle function and muscle health, uh, your bone density, to your cardio, you know, your cardiovascular health and your metabolic system and your weight and mindset and everything. So I think pelvic health, when you can get pelvic health right, it 
takes care of a lot of other areas of your health. When you have issues with leaking or prolapse or pelvic pain or whatever it may be, it can stop you socializing. Um, it can stop you exercising. And, and, and that affects your physical body. It affects your mental health. It affects your, your confidence socially. And it can have such a knock-on effect. So getting pelvic health right is just so important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you so much for that. Um, you do online consultations as well, don't you? So if people want to find you, they can I find do. you down below physio. Um, yes, down below physio on Facebook and Instagram. Down below physio.ie is the website. And I do online consultations. And then just I give a lot of information and little tips and advice on the, the social media platforms as well. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they're very good. Brilliant. Look, thank you so much. I will end this here and um, and hopefully we will speak again at some other stage. We should do um, bladders. We'll do bladders. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I always <laughs> say I could talk about this all day. It's getting me to stop talking about it. That's the, <laughs> the hard thing. <laughs> I know how you feel. Brilliant. I'll speak to you soon. Take care. No problem. Thank you. Bye.